All right, welcome back. So a few administrative things before we dive in. So first off, I got a question earlier about when the final reports are due. Um, and so I propose the following timeline. Let me know what you think. We have just uh, two more weeks of class left, I think, next week and the one after. Um, I was saving May 4th and 6th for the final presentations. We're very likely going to need both sessions there. Um, and I would like to um, have the, these presentations before you have to hand in the report so that you could use some of the feedback from the presentations to improve your final reports. So I wanna make that as useful as possible, the, the final presentations so that you have more chance to work on your reports. So now I looked this up before class and hopefully I didn't make a mistake. It seems like the final grading deadline is May 25th. Uh, so that's when the CMU grades have to be entered in the system. Um, if you think that's incorrect, let me know because I briefly looked at this. I might be wrong, but if that's true, then uh, I propose we have the we have you submit the final reports on the seventeenth. So that's of the Monday a week before, uh, which will give me just about enough time to grade them before I have to hand them grades. Uh, and which should give you uh, at least a week after the presentations to uh, incorporate some of the feedback you'll be getting. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, if you have other ideas for how to do this differently, let me know. Uh, but so unless I hear differently, let's go with, with this. Okay, um, the other thing, just to remind you where we are, uh, we, we talked about mixed methods designs on Tuesday. Um, and that leaves us with precisely three lectures, except for the final presentations. Um, this is the snapshot from the course website. What I was hoping to do today is talk a little bit about sort of paper production and, and writing and graphics and things like this, kind of a meta topic. Um, and that still leaves us with two meetings. So I think it would be interesting, uh, and I promised you this earlier on in the semester, if we talk about some controversial papers. I think we didn't really talk about drama in science much or controversy in science much. We talked about pretty good uh, papers that have all been accepted and there wasn't much drama around them. So I thought it'd be interesting to sort of step back a little bit and reflect also on atypical cases. Science isn't always you know, straightforward and, and uh, clean and so on. Um, and you know, sometimes there's all kinds of things, um, all kinds of mess around research and publications. But I thought it'd be interesting to think about these. So I propose the following. I have a list here of some papers that I'm hoping we discuss next week. Um, what I'd like to do is have everybody read these. So I think in order to have a deeper discussion about what's going on with these papers, um, we sort of each have to have an informed opinion about what's happening, more so than we were able to do with somebody sort of giving us an overview of a study uh, to give us a sense of you know, what the methods were and how they fit together and so on. Because right? here, I think we really need to really understand what was going on there and have an opinion so to have a productive conversation. So um, I would still like a volunteer to lead the discussion for each of these, but I'd like to ask you all to read these before class. Um, so I have a list. I think we could do these three on Tuesday uh, and I have another couple that we could do on Thursday. Um, and I'm looking for some volunteers. So if you haven't yet presented a paper uh, in class, then you must pick one of these. If you have already presented, but you find some of these interesting and you wanna go again, please, please do so. Um, but basically I'm looking for three volunteers for Tuesday. And I think we could do these three. And then another, um, one or two volunteers for Thursday to do these other ones. There's actually 
each of these, well, not all of them, but some of these have some additional context and commentary around them. Uh, I haven't put all the references here in the slide, but I'll follow up with, with those separately. So there's been more back and forth between some of these authors. There's some commentary on the retracted article that's kind of part of the same story um, that would sort of fit in, fit in with the paper itself. Um, there's more back and forth between the authors here uh, that's not on in these two publications uh, and so on. But I'll, I'll follow up with details separately. Um, point now is um, three volunteers for Tuesday and let's say uh, at least one for Thursday. And if you haven't presented, then you're sort of automatically volunteered. Uh, I can do the retracted article for Tuesday. Retracted article for Tuesday. Okay. Noted. I can do the uh, 2014 Shepherd paper. Okay. You want to think about this during class and let me know at the end. I can come back to this. Okay. And these are the ones for, for Thursday. This is going to be very juicy. I've actually been following this discussion. Uh, happened, I don't know, a year or so ago, maybe two years ago. Now, a year has been just a pandemic, probably two years ago that this happened. And it played out very, very publicly and very loudly. Uh, and it was a very juicy discussion. Um, I, th I think this is going to be interesting. Is the for for the thursday one is is it one person for both of them or is it one person it so um it helps if the one person um reads and pr presents both because one is a criticism of the other but we could also split it up if you want to do so one person uh presenting the original paper one person presenting the critique we could do that too mm -hmm. yeah i'd be okay with taking both Okay, so we'll, we'll put you down for, for Thursday. And then we still need one person then for the Bresnau paper on Tuesday. So I'll let you think about this during class and we could uh, we can come back to this. Um, okay, so any thoughts or questions before I move on to the main topic? About anything, reports, things? Okay, well then, so what I'd like to do in the remaining time today is shift gears a little bit and talk about something that um, is strictly speaking, not an empirical research method, but I sort of think of it in the same vein and in the same way that we learn about methods for doing the research itself. I think it'd be useful to spend just the one hour today um, reflecting on methods for communicating said research that we have just done. Uh, and communication happens in writing, it happens orally, happens through presentations, happens through talks at conferences or seminars or what have you, happens through the paper itself that you're writing. By the way, um, this might also be useful with your final reports as you're thinking about those and with your final presentations uh, as you're thinking about those as well. Uh, as well as with any other reports or presentations or papers you might be writing outside of this class. There's not really anything specifically empirical about the discussion today. Um, and um, I want to encourage you to uh, take a look at this book or these couple of books by Edward Tufte if you haven't had a chance to look at these. So really fascinating uh, stuff. I'll cover some of the, I think, so very relevant points for us uh, in class today, but this is just um, um, a plug for these books. Um, okay, so let me start with graphics. So sort of one of the, I think, most overlooked parts of a research paper is the graphics. I think rarely do people uh, put a lot of thought into designing beautiful figures and tables and things like this in their research papers. It's mostly um, just kind of something put together, maybe with the default settings for whatever software you're using to produce these, 
without much thought into sort of the design of these. So um, I want to walk you through some of these um, principles that the Tufta book talks about, uh, and hopefully get you excited about thinking, uh, putting more thought and effort into how you're designing graphics in your papers and or presentations. Um, so let me start with this. Uh, are you familiar with this? You know what this is? I see nods. This is, according to Tufta and the book, arguably the most beautiful graph uh, visualization of statistical data ever made. This is a visualization of the losses suffered by Napoleon's army in the Russian campaign of the eight, 1800s. It was 1812 or something, if I remember correctly. So the reason why this is so amazing, so first of all, it's very old. It was, um, this came out um, by this French person, Charles Menard, and the 1850s or something. So it's sort of a very, very old example of a visualization of statistical data. data. Um, and it's so amazing because it um, integrates in the same figure five or six different variables. It visualizes concurrently five or six different variables, which is really, really hard to do. Okay, so the book talks in a lot more detail about why this is so amazing. But the key idea is, so let me, let me so describe this figure for you. What you see here is um, the size of Napoleon's army and how that changed, how it evolved over time and over geographical space as they were um, attacking Russia, they were invading Russia back in the 1800s. So you see them on the top left, uh, starting in current day, I think Lithuania. And then in the top right is Moscow represented. So you see sort of how the army shrank as they were approaching Moscow and how they shrank, the army shrank even more as they were returning uh, from that campaign. So, so the yellow tan is the going to Moscow and the black is the coming back from. The other thing that's very interesting about this is, so, so you already see a couple of things visualized here. You see that, so this dimension, the size of the army, you see space being represented and X and Y, if you will, so uh, geographic space. You see time represented left to right and then back uh, right to left in, in the bottom uh, part. Um, the temperature uh, during that period of time is, is represented at the bottom. So you can see how there's this very um, visible correlation between the, uh, how cold it was outside and, and so how the army shrank because they all uh, froze presumably and, and were starving and they were, didn't have anything to eat by, in the dead of winter back then uh, and things like this. So the point I wanna make here is that, you know, Probably, probably in your research papers, you won't be uh, in the situation to, to visualize five or six different things at the same time. Uh, and maybe you're not working with geographic data, but this shows how um, if you put some effort and thought into so designing your graphics, they can be very, very powerful. So like, arguably this is an amazing uh, visualization of some data, right? That sort of integrates all of these dimensions in a very concise and very informative, so very powerful way. So this is just use that motivation. Um, the thing that I think is very relevant for us doing uh, empirical research in computer science is that we have a lot of data uh, to uh, describe in research papers or presentations and or to visualize graphically. So now there's, there's this one principle that the book talks about. The principle is um, above all else, you should show the data uh, and you should design your tables and figures and so on um, such that you draw the viewer's attention to the sense and substance of that data and not to anything else. It's like, think about how this thing draws your attention as viewers to the sense of what was going on, the sort of progression of events in this campaign and how, sort of how 
the size of the army changed and how this correlated with temperature and so on. So you get you get all of this um, sense of what actually happened by looking at this, right? Uh, and this abstracts away from other things that are uh, just distractions. So this is sort of something to aspire to also as you're visualizing uh, empirical data. So now the book talks about this heuristic uh, called the data ink ratio. So here the idea is you can uh, imagine, uh, you know, imagine you're printing these on uh, paper, these figures or tables or what have you, okay? Uh, and you can separate out the amount of ink that you've used to print the actual uh, data or things related to the data, things that change from figure to figure, from the amount of ink that's used for auxiliary things. Okay, so imagine you could uh, estimate or separate this. So the book talks about how you should strive to maximize this ratio. You should strive to use as much of the ink you're using to uh, print that figure or table, use that for the data, the information that's uh, in the data itself, and not for other redu redundant things, right? That would stay the same no matter what data you plug into, into those figures or tables. So that's the heuristic. So here's how this would look. So simple example, bar plots. What do you see here? A lot of bars. What's data here uh, and therefore information? And what's redundant or boilerplate? The, the length of the bar is the information. Mm -hmm. And the, probably the position of the x axis probably indicates the type of or something, some mm -hmm. feature of the data. The redundant, I guess the color of the file is redundant. Possibly. What else? Maybe the where where are you spending ink to print this? Yeah. Uh, the bars, you know, there are lots of different heights. So overall you can see it's varied. So you could have less bars or group them together, maybe. Presumably the bars are just the, the data that you're um, actually looking to plot. So um, I, is, is there anything else you see in this figure that is not tied to the data itself, but it's sort of just boilerplate? The border around the chart? Yes, that's a very obvious thing to get rid of, okay? The border around the chart adds nothing but wastes ink. So the book talks about how um, you should remove the box. Okay, the box is just wasted ink. It is not does not convey any information about your data. It does not convey any sense or meaning of the data itself. The box is just boilerplate. Okay, so here the box was removed. The um, um, ticks on the axes were removed, okay? Instead of the ticks on the axes, they proposed to use this white grid lines, okay? That sort of give you this uniform sense of the where that 5% line is across all of the categories uh, visualized, okay? And as a side effect, it also saves a little bit of ink because you're printing less ink on those bars, right? So if that's your metric, if saving ink is your metric, the white line saves even more ink, okay? This is one example of how you can convert this less informative bar plot into this more informative one by uh, stripping the box and the vertical axis and the ticks, okay? Here's another one, uh, box plots. You've seen lots of these. Um, the box plots show, so the, the line in the middle there is the median. And then um, inside the box, you have the, the bottom 25th quartile and the top 75th quartile. 
um, and then you have the uh, the range um, and the dotted or dashed uh, lines. What, what do you see here? Where can you save ink? The side lines of the mm, white boxes. Side lines of the white boxes. Mm -hmm. the, the vertical side lines, you mean? Mm -hmm. What else? The dotted lines? Maybe. Like the vertical dotted lines. Possibly. Either that here's or the, the horizontal ones. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a proposal from the book. So they uh, say, you know, and the left, the version of the left hand side, uh, across so there's 10 categories there, 10 individual box plots. You have 50 horizontal lines across those 10 box plots and 30 verticals. So I think they're counting the two sides of the box as two verticals and this uh, dashed line that's behind it uh, as a third. Uh, and you have 10 of those, so there's 30 verticals, okay? And now they're showing how you can represent all of the same information without any loss by using only 10 verticals and no horizontals whatsoever. Okay, so the lines representing the medians have been replaced by these dots. And um, the start and end point of the white space in the middle is the 25th and 75th quartile. And then the top and bottom of those verticals is whatever you had there on the left-hand side. So these two uh, are equivalent, except one uses a lot less ink and therefore is more uh, effective at communicating the sense and meaning of the data without distracting uh, with unnecessary stuff. But like, is this uh, easy consumable by the readers? Like I'm familiar with the left ones, so the right ones might not seem much informative to you. Yeah, so I'll come, that's a good point. So I'll come back to this. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about presentations later. Um, we've been conditioned to uh, think about things in a certain way. For example, to expect these box plots to be boxy. Uh, and we might, be surprised when we see them um, drawn differently. I think you can get around this by just to explaining them, for example, once, so that people um, understand what they are and how they relate to something they're familiar with, uh, and then reuse them without explanation later, for example, in the same paper. Here's another one, very standard scatter plot, okay, of a two-dimensional data set. What can you do to save ink? It doesn't take much ink, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is why this is an interesting challenge. How can you use even less? The, the axis lines that go along the X and Y axis aren't really needed. You get rid of them and keep the hash marks and it's the same. Keep the hash with the ticks? You can keep the ticks and get rid of the actual axis lines. Mm -hmm. Th this is close. The, the one they propose here is to replace this conventional scatter plot by something they call a range frame. So here, what they've done is they've removed the part around the origin. Um, and each of these uh, horizontal and vertical axes start at the minimum values of those respective variables and end at the maximum values. So they just depict the actual range, min to max on the X and Y axes. Okay, this, this uses less ink than the previous version, conveys actually more information because it explicitly encodes the uh, minimum and maximum values. Another version of this is called the dot dash plot which um, replaces, I think this is closer to what you are suggesting, Jeremy, replaces the uh, axes, the horizontal and vertical lines by these marginal frequency distributions. So these are essentially just projections of the 
the values on the x and the y axes that show the distribution. Okay. Um, Here's another one. Go ahead. Doesn't this strategy um, risk falling into some traps, though? So the bar graph was a specific example. If you have a bar graph and all the values are above a certain amount, it's tempting sometimes to reduce, to compress the scale of the bar graph and get rid of everything redundant below a certain amount. But this is like bad practice. This is yes, great. Practice. Great. So uh, the book talks a lot about this. Uh, and there's another book I referenced earlier in the class called How to Lie with Statistics that also talks a lot about that. Uh, so I refer you to either one of those for lengthy discussions of how um, what you said is true and happens frequently and you shouldn't do it. So I, I agree. Yes, you shouldn't manipulate the axis, truncate the axes to um, increase the um, apparent difference between groups. All right. So I, I'm not saying that you could do this for every single plot. This thing with like truncating um, or replacing the axes by just the ranges of variables. I don't know if you could do this for every single plot. I explicitly, specifically talked about scatter plots. I don't know if I can generalize this to bar plots for the reasons you mentioned. Okay. This. Anybody that has ever uh, worked with me uh, on a draft or a paper before has heard me complain about this. Um, you should never, ever, ever, ever use vertical lines in your tables. There is absolutely no reason why you should do that. There's no reason why you should use vertical lines in your table. They only add clutter and waste ink and this particular metric. They detract from the actual data you're looking to convey. So, but you're asking, how do I design these tables anyway so that they're readable? Well, with these horizontal divider lines that separate out categories or groups of columns. Okay, not with vertical lines between them. Um, so here's another example of the same. By the way, pro tip, if you're using LaTeX for um, your typesetting, then um, the book tabs package in LaTeX gives you exactly these super pretty tables that I'm uh, showing you here. So these are two tables, two versions of this, uh, two tables, um, visualizing, re re summarizing, representing exactly the same data. Um, the left-hand side one is close to something you might be tempted to um, design without thinking too much about the design of your tables. The one on the right-hand side illustrates this principle of no vertical lines. And this is achieved with the book tabs package in, um, in LaTeX. Um, notice how the vertical spacing between the column headers and the table rows is very different when you're using the proper package as compared to when you're just using horizontal lines in like plain LaTeX, which is what you see on the left-hand side. Okay, so these are both aligned at the bottom. Notice how much taller and readable and nicer the one on the right hand side is compared to the default one on the left hand side okay so don't use just plain horizontal lines use these top middle and bottom rules from the book tabs package okay another cool thing from the book um and i've seen this used a lot and i really like it they're called spark lines so this this idea of combining inlining um, your numbers typically in a table with some simple intense word sized uh, small graphics that can be inlined. So here you see an example of how uh, this table that contains all of these numbers, um, I don't know, values of whatever uh, 
exchange rate uh, was being uh, visualized there, combines that with the overall trend for those variables in line, like with these small bite-sized word-sized graphics. Okay? This is very powerful because it, it gives you not just the sense of uh, you know min and max, but also gives a sense of trend and progression. So much it gives you much more sense into how the data behaves than um, without this. So here's an example. I just pulled this from a, a, a software engineering paper, but you'll see a, a lot of examples of uh, spark lines in in research papers. Here, the example is of these little histograms you see there. That gives you that give you a sense of the distribution of those variables, okay? Inlined, word sized inside the table. Okay, very cool. Those spark lines. Um, and finally, um, the book talks about so how there's some magic uh, ratio, magic proportion when you're designing figures like these um, that make these a lot more readable. Uh, and there's some science behind this. Um, and the uh, book talks about how you should prefer lumpy over spiky. So prefer horizontal, wider things over sort of vertical, narrower things. There's lots of reasons why this is happening that you could read about in the book. Have to do with, uh, I don't know, with cognition and perception and things like that. But the, so the example on the left-hand side here is much more readable than the one on the right-hand side, even though the plots are otherwise exactly the same. Okay. So this is what I had to say about graphics. Any, any more thoughts on graphics? Is it just silly? Saving ink? We don't print stuff out so much anymore. So ink is a bad metric. OK, so let me move on to the second part for today. So what I've done is I have, um, so this is going to be about slide design specifically about presentations, but specifically about the slide design part of presenting, uh, designing a slide deck to uh, augment uh, a presentation or talk that you're giving. Um, and you've seen probably, uh, I don't know, dozens of different pieces of advice that tell you to do things a certain way or not to do things a certain way uh, about designing presentations and slides, uh, in particular slide decks. Um, and um, I was, so I've, I've seen these two, right? Um, they are everywhere. Um, but what I was very curious about is if there's any scientific evidence to support any of them. This is after all a methods class and I've, I'm trying to teach you to be skeptical of claims without supporting evidence of any kind. So what I've done here is I went and I read all the research papers about uh, slide design and presenting that I could find. And I tried to summarize all of the science behind slide design. Uh, and I want to report on some of my uh, findings here, okay, with, with stuff that uh, there is so supporting scientific evidence about. Um, let me start with this. There is. Um, I, I copied a lot of slides from this presentation by Atkinson and others. Um, so there is this um, theory um, that describes how um, and, and why the design of uh, PowerPoint-like presentations should be compatible with how people learn in order for it to be effective. Um, when I'm saying PowerPoint here, I'm not specifically referring to the PowerPoint software, uh, although that's probably the most common, but any, any similar software used to design slides, like, I don't know, I use Keynote on my Mac, people use Google Slides and so on, they're all very similar. So I'm sort of referring to all of these generically as PowerPoint things, uh, even though they have so, uh, somewhat different features. Um, so now the theory goes like this, that, um, 
these PowerPoint presentations look the way they do because of the features of the software that was used to create them, not because of some sort of fundamental principles about communicating information and learning and whatnot. So this goes back to uh, Nadia's uh, comment from earlier, like what if um, people are just used to seeing boxy box plots, right? Like if you change the boxes in the box plots, it will be confusing. That's sort of the idea here. People are used to designing often bad slides because of how these uh, presentation designing software uh, are created and the features they offer. Um, just because of how the people are used to doing it this way, because that's sort of the convenient way of using the software that uh, they're using to do this. Um, so because PowerPoint makes it easy to use templates, people use templates. It's not that people use templates because they have some sort of underlying fundamental benefit to learning or communicating. It's because it's easy to use in PowerPoint. The same for bulleted lists, the same for putting lots of stuff on the screen and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, as it turns out, uh, some of these features and techniques in PowerPoint and similar software contradict the research in cognitive science about how people learn uh, and process information. So the reference is this book on multimedia learning uh, by um, Robert Meyer, sorry, Richard Meyer. Um, th this is the book that talks about some of this cognitive science behind how people process information. Um, so the theory uh, goes like this. The theory says there are two um, channels through which the human mind processes information, the visual channel and the verbal channel. Okay, So the visual channel handles all of this information that's presented to the eyes like illustrations and animations and videos and graphics and the text on the screen and so on, stuff that you see with your eyes. And the verbal handles the information uh, that's presented to your ears, right, such as speech and narration and sounds. Okay, so two channels to process information. Um, and, um, you know, this is a sort of limited capacity thing. So, the constraints on our processing capacity um, force us to make decisions between uh, which pieces of incoming information through these channels we um, decide to pay attention to, the degree that we uh, build connections between them and so on, the degree between, with which we build connections between whatever we um, process through each of these channels and stuff we already know, uh, and so on and so forth, okay? So um, we can't, the point is, we can't process sort of an infinite stream of information through both of these channels in parallel. That's just apparently how the mind works, okay? So now when, um, uh, so the first, the first limitation here is the limited, limited capacity. So if, you're presented with some illustration or graphic, there's only some limited amount of these that you can store in your working memory at any one time. Okay? And similarly, when you're presented with speech, there's only a number, some limited number of words or phrases or whatever that you can process, you can store in your working memory at any time. So there's limited capacity. You can't process and store all of this. Um, Okay, so now the, um, you need to be able um, to, um, so but how, how do you understand material that's being presented? Apparently you do that when you pay attention to it, you organize it in your mind in some mental structure that's coherent and you integrate it with stuff that you already know. That's how you, that's how understanding information works, apparently. Um, so it's an active process is the point here. It's something that happens in real time as you're being exposed to these streams of information. 
it's not that you first accumulate all of this information in your working memory and only then after you've accumulated all of it do you start processing it it's that processing of this information happens as you're uh, receiving it so it has, happens in real time okay so what does this mean for us this means that um so for slide design it means that for a um when you're designing presentations you should use both visual and verbal forms of presentation because apparently the human mind has these dual channels of processing information okay if you're only using one of those you're sort of communicating inefficiently because there's another one that can be used to receive additional information um, okay but um, if you try to uh, provide too much information through your presentation or slides that will easily overload people's cognitive capacities um, and instead you should present your information in a way that helps people to select to organize and to integrate to make connections between the information that um, uh, you're presenting. So these are sort of the implications for designing um, slides. So how do these actually play out in, in slide design? What does this actually mean? So how do we act on these? So um, let me give you some sort of research backed techniques that take these implications into account when designing slides, presentations, uh, so that you can reduce the cognitive load you're exposing your uh, audience to. Okay, so number one, number one, really important. If from all of this lecture today about presenting, you remember just one thing, make this be the one thing. This is really impactful and really easy to do. So it is to write a clear headline that explains the main idea of every slide as the title, if you will, of that slide. This is called the assertion evidence model of slide design and is very well backed up by research. And okay. so um, the example here on the left hand side is arguably a very typical example of um, designing an otherwise reasonably pretty slide, right? So it has some, a little bit of text, not too much, some graphics as a figure, it's a very airy, nice slide overall. But notice the title here. The title is not very, um, the title is not an assertion, right? The title is just sort of some uh, general category label or some, something like this. So instead, the model says, instead of this one bit label, you should use an assertion as the title of your slide. For example, in this case, the assertion could be that nuclear fusion combines deuterium and tritium to form helium and energy. The title of the slide is an assertion that conveys the main message of that chemical reaction you see there represented on the slide. Okay, very small change, arguably, from the two designs. Everything else stayed the same except for the title. So now they actually did an experiment here. You can see the reference at the bottom. You can look this up. The experiment showed that um, test scores of students exposed to uh, these two versions of the same slide increased substantially between the two versions when asked this question what is the chemical representation for nuclear fusion the assertion slide the one on the right right behind me is the one that gave a 23 percent increase in the test scores of students on this very same question okay so a lot higher retention right between these two versions of the same slide very small change very easy to do well yeah um, i actually have a question uh so for the the um the second slide is it 
that the sentence become too long and probably make it complicated for humans to process during the presentation. And I also have questions about the experiment. I don't know what the specific context of this experiment, but I would say that the second slides may be better for review. For example, if the students want to review after the class, the second slide certainly may be better than the first slide because they can easily say what the slide is about. But during the presentation, it might be better uh, if we could give them shorter scenes with uh, uh, like words explaining what it is and what the slide is about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I will actually comment on this in a minute. So let, let me let me postpone answering uh, or addressing that comment for another minute or so. Um, but yes, you're right. I, I don't know the details of the experiment. You have to read the original paper I, I cited there. But I have comments about the other thing you mentioned about um, so the context here. So let, let me come back to that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Jeremy. Uh, yeah, this. Um... This assertion that it's probably fine during the presentation assumes that people are paying attention to your presentation 100% of the time, which is just not the case usually. And if you zone out for one second and you miss the title of this slide and you look back at it, one of these is much easier to context switch back into. Yeah, there's... yeah thanks, that's, I, that's a good point too. Thank you. Okay, so um, then I have here on the deck, but I'm not going to insist on this, a lot more examples of how uh, to convert um, so traditional style slides into a equivalent assertion evidence model slides, together with some of the evidence from these studies about the increased effectiveness of these redesigned slides. Um, so I'm just going to flip through these to give you a sense um, of how you might do this, but I'm not going to sort of describe them in detail or insist on them. You can you can look this up afterwards. Here's one that's interesting. Let me uh, spend one minute on this. So here you see a very sort of typical. Um, text heavy, even if it has a figure, text heavy slide on the left hand side that has been converted into this one assertion slide with the figure in the forefront. Um, the study here um, shows that um, the students who were exposed to this redesigned version of the slide, um, there were 110 students in some engineering class, um, they showed superior comprehension, fewer misconceptions, um, lower perceived cognitive loads, and stronger recall um, post-test when exposed to this um, redesigned version of the same slide. This was uh, sort of another different study from the ones before. That was sort of very interesting. Um, oops. I guess I had something there that I, OK. Um, there was something else I wanted to say there, but I, it seems I accidentally skipped that slide, so I don't have that ready. Um, so th this was point number one. Point number one is make your titles into meaningful assertions, even if you change nothing else. This will probably make your content much more uh, understandable and retainable. Uh, point number two, is to break up your story into small digestible bites. Um, and it turns out um, that people learn better when they're uh, presented with information in bite-sized segments. This is, by the way, if you ever, <clears throat> uh, if you ever saw an online class, like, I don't know, the Coursera style or similar, if you ever saw an online class like that, a MOOC, um, you see that often the way they're designed is to have sort of relatively short modules that focus on sort of small things. Uh, and then there's some quiz or something at the end before moving on to the other module. This is this idea of bite-sized uh, digestible pieces of information. So segmentation is um, 
useful. It apparently it mediates the effects of working memory, limited working memory capacity um, and uh, increases um, information processing ability and retention. Um, so one way to actually do this, there's actually two ways to do this. One way to do this is to use this slide sorter or thumbnail view in your favorite presentation software um, to sort of organize and cluster and things like this, break up your story into more digestible pieces. Another way I do this myself, I encourage my students to do this as well because it works for me. Um, the way I do this is to, before I touch any presentation design software like PowerPoint or Keynote, um, I try to draft the main story of that talk on paper uh, or using post-it notes. Uh, and you write down a small idea on each of these post-it notes, for example, or, or, or in pieces of paper or in a document. Um, uh, one sentence, basically the assertion of that slide, uh, the title, if you will, what will become the title of that slide, you write down that one sentence uh, and you write all of these down and you just sort of assemble them into some coherent story before you even think about how to support them with evidence, how to design graphics, incorporate graphics, all of these other things. But just sort of crystallizing what the message and the story and the structure of the talk is before you worry about any of the other stuff that have to do with just pure design. It's a very effective way of um, having a crisp, clear story before you worry about em embellishing it and supporting it with um, uh, visuals. Okay, these were two. Number three, um, this comes back to, I promised Bobo I would address this comment that, uh, that you made earlier. This comes back to that, I hope. Uh, the, um, point here is that you can um, reduce visual load by moving text from the slide into your speech. Okay, so in your case, you're saying, you know, isn't it better to narrate that assertion, include that in your speech rather than having it be on the slide? So the answer is you know, maybe, and some conditions it might be better. Um, turns out, right? According to this principle here, um, it, it seems that uh, there's some evidence supporting the claim that people understand multimedia explanations better when words are presented as narration rather than on-screen text. Okay, um, and. Um, there's this study that sort of talks about how, uh, how they arrived at this conclusion, how um, combining uh, in, in these instructional materials, combining um, speech with text um, or, and the charts and graphics was more effective than presenting all the information visually or textually on the slide. So combining speech with slide content is more effective than just the one. Um, and, and something, I'm missing a slide there as well, odd. I don't know what's happening with my slide design, it's terrible. Like I'm giving a presentation about slide design and I have terrible slide design. I'm missing slides, interesting, okay. Um, there was there was more stuff I had there, but somehow uh, it went away. I don't know what happened. Number um, number four. This is the same point from before. No, this is a new point. The point is, aha. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. So point is visuals together with words instead of words alone is more effective. So here they're saying that um, people remember more if I narrate figures on the slide rather than have my narration be redundant with text on the slide. This was the comment that Bobo made. 
okay, I think. Um, but there's some uh, exceptions here. Okay? So it turns out students performed worse on recall uh, and recognition tasks and hated the uh, presentation more if it included the graphics that were not relevant. So adding graphics to your slide just for the sake of embellishment is worse than not having them there in the first place. Okay. So graphics, if you put them on the slide, they have to be meaningful. Um, so clip art style graphics would make your slides worse and your presentations worse um, if they're irrelevant. Um, another but is that if the um, visuals, the graphics, and the text are incongruent, if they don't align, that's worse than if you have text only slides. So a wall of text with no graphics is better than less text with irrelevant graphics. Isn't that interesting? Because you're, I guess, I guess the way I understand this, your brain is sort of struggling to reconcile the, you know, the, the message that the figure conveys with the message that the text conveys, and both are being received and processed in parallel, and you're just failing to do this because they're they're incongruent, they don't align. So it makes retention worse. Um, even even if uh, the authors agree here that a text-only presentation. Uh, is less interesting. The subjects found it to be less interesting, but it was more effective at communicating the information and retention. Um, side note, pro tip. This is from uh, uh, Ellen Viterchik, who was our uh, TA last year in 15300. I learned this from her. Pro tip, for a more polished look of your graphics, consider cropping images to circles that will make for a more polished look using the same images. Okay. Um, you could do this um, in, uh, I'm using Keynote for my slides. Um, you could do this very, very easily by putting a circle mask on top of any figure. Uh, for example, in, in Keynote, I imagine PowerPoint is similar. Okay, point number five. Keep it simple. Uh, if you add needless complexity to your slides, it makes things worse. Um, so um, this, you will find this amusing, I think. Um, the question is, will deliberately increasing the complexity of one's vocabulary give the impression of higher intelligence? Is it that if we use very complicated technical terms and things like that, when giving a presentation at a, I don't know, scientific conference, academic conference, um, are we uh, going to be perceived as more intelligent? Um, so this study that I'm quoting here says no, uh, says that um, there is a negative relationship between complexity of vocabulary and judged intelligence. In other words, the uh, presenters using more complicated vocabulary were perceived as being less, not more intelligent. Isn't that interesting? I just like how the title of the paper is, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that. The title of the paper is Needlessly Complex, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. The, the other thing the study found is that if your texts um, are hard to read, okay, then um, you also risk being perceived as less intelligent. So somehow, uh, so fluency mediates this 
negative impact of complexity. Do you know what's audience of this experiment? Like who are the people being tested? Well, you're welcome to uh, read the study. I don't remember the details. Yeah, I, I guess the, the question I'm asking is, is that maybe for those, for the audience who are experienced in the field or know something about the, what the presenter is talking about, uh, this effect might be true, but for the outsiders that might be opposite, uh, I get this impression that when we talk with others about machine learning, and those people who are not familiar with machine learning or didn't even go to college or receive higher education that they think machine learning are always good, advanced, fancy stuff. But for those really machine learning people, machine learning researchers, that they will be more critical about the when you say machine learning or some fancy terms in machine learning. Okay, yeah, so um, uh, two, two things here. One is I appreciate that you are being skeptical uh, this is exactly the, I think, healthy dose of skepticism that I've been advertising this entire semester and that I'm hoping to develop in all of you as scientists and researchers, right? So, you know, when presented with claims, even claims from research papers, you should always be skeptical and you know, not take them at face value. So, you know, you're right. We need to go back and check the details of the study and sort of you know, think about confounding factors and study design and context and all, all of these other things. So yeah, completely agreed. Second point, uh, it's probably that we need more studies. It's sort of unlikely that any single study like this one will be able to uh, capture all of these, you know, the different contexts and different variables that are important and, and confounding factors and so on uh, in, in a convincing enough way that we could to fully take this uh, and to just run with it without any additional evidence. So um, I, we need more of these, right? We talked about throughout the entire semester, we talked about how knowledge accumulates over time through uh, you know, multiple studies and, and replications and meta-analyses and things like that. And sort of hardly ever, if, if ever, probably never from just any individual study. So uh, in short, be skeptical, it's good, you know, go read the paper, replicate it, right? try it out, uh, see if it holds in a different context and so on, right? Explore those mediators that you discussed or, or moderators. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I didn't, by the way, when I said I'm gonna summarize the um, uh, empirical evidence about the science of slide design, I didn't say that the, the science is done, it's over. Uh, you know, it's time to um, not worry about this anymore, that we have all the answers to all of these questions and we could uh, you know, design the absolute perfect presentations with uh, utmost confidence in, uh, in our slide design. I, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, okay, so a controversial claim. Um, turns out, according to this study, turns out that Fonts don't matter much as long as they're not too exotic. You could ask, you know, should, which font should I use? Um, if you're submitting papers to computer science venues, typically the template is fixed. So there's no choice in what fonts you're using for typical computer science research papers because there's some fixed template that the venue enforces. So they're all the same. Um, there's certainly choice um, of font size in the graphics that you're designing and including in your papers. Uh, I have just a few days ago had this discussion with one of my students about uh, whether to use serif or sans serif fonts in, in their graphics and their research paper. Um, this study claims that there's not much difference. There's no significant, statistically significant difference between serif and sans serif, for example. Um, on how comfortable to read, how attractive and how interesting these fonts were perceived. But I don't know the context of the study well enough to um, conclude or claim that this is universal. Um, personally, I would never use serif fonts in a figure. I think that's ugly, but you know, that's just one of me. So don't, uh, don't take my word for this. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so there's a couple more references. I won't go over this. You could read about this um, offline. There's a couple more papers that try to summarize major pitfalls of PowerPoint. Um, this is one that talks about 18 specific major pitfalls grouped into three categories. There's another paper that talks about lots and lots and lots of uh, pitfalls of visual representations in general. You can find the references here in the slide deck and you can, you can read this afterwards uh, on your own. So, uh, oh yeah, and a few more resources uh, on sort of how to design uh, impactful presentations. By the way, the GCC here at CMU uh, is a huge proponent of this assertion evidence model. Uh, I, they have more resources about this as well. Um, okay, so that is that. Any thoughts on, on this before the last part of my uh, talk today? Okay, I take that as a no. So finally, just a few tidbits. I stole all of this shamelessly from my colleague, Claire Leguess. I claim no credit for any of this. Um, a few tidbits uh, about things that she and I both find annoying um, in drafts of papers that we edit that are we're writing together with our students. Um, and so things that we keep repeating over and over again about writing in general. So I figured it'd be useful to um, illustrate some of these things that um, both of us find annoying. Um, okay, so this is gonna be sort of a, a bullet list of things to do or not to do when writing in general. So, okay, number one, use clear, precise language and use simple, short, declarative, importantly, active voice sentences, not passive, okay? Do not ever use the passive voice in your research papers. Number two, use pronouns and adverbs judiciously. Um, adverbs are uh, typically imprecise, okay? So if, you, if something, if the problem you're working on uh, that you want to use as motivation for your research in your problem gap hook design. Uh, it, if you perceive your problem to be incredibly important, or you want to write about it as incredibly important, you know what does the word in the adverb um, incredibly uh, add here that important lacked on its own? Right? Incredibly is sort of an imprecise adverb here. Uh, and you know how much more important than just important is something that is incredibly important, right? Can you you know can you quantify that? So this is just bad practice. Do not use um, adverbs in scientific writing because they're so fundamentally imprecise. Use them judiciously. Um, okay, pronouns are often unclear with respect to their antecedents, which can confuse the reader. So try to avoid them if you can. Don't refer to it, uh, um, refer to the actual object or whatever subject, uh, not to it if it's unclear what that refers to. Be explicit and concrete. So for example, instead of saying this data set has a few attributes, many attributes, just say how many. This data set has 22 attributes, right? There's no need to be uh, implicit here. Just say how many there are. Um, similarly, instead of we performed a number of experiments or the cat had a number of lives, just count them, okay? We performed four experiments, the cat had nine lives. Clear, precise language. Okay, I can't open the comment in chat, Austin. Do you want me to? Is that okay? Side side comment. Um. Okay. Let's see. Next, do not use more syllabus syllables than necessary. Uh, for example. Instead of in order to, everybody uses this all the time, in order to this or that, just use to. There's no need for the extra syllables. It doesn't add anything. Okay. 
um, utilize, I've just seen this recently in, in a paper, um, utilize uses too many syllables, just use use instead, the same thing, fewer syllables. So notice how this, if you will, illustrates that same principle that we started uh, our discussion today from of saving ink, it's kind of the same idea. You're saving ink on unnecessary words or syllables, just like you're saving ink on unnecessary parts of tables and figures. Okay. Um, right, so the point of writing is to communicate an idea. So if you use too many syllables than necessary, more than necessary, it obscures the idea without adding meaning and exactly the same way that vertical lines in tables obscure the sense and meaning of that data without adding anything. Okay, um, numbers, how should you present numbers? So it's interesting. Um, apparently you should write out in letters all positive numbers that are less than or equal to 10, okay? Unless they are in a sentence with a number that is greater than 10, in which case you should write them in numbers. So um, instead of we analyze the number two data sets, you should always write, we analyze two, the word two data sets, okay? But similarly, um, because of this um, greater than 10 exception to the rule, instead of we interviewed two designers and 12 users, you should spell out in, sorry, we sh you should use numbers for both of those, even the one that's less than 10. Okay, so this is something that's a very often overlooked. Um, once you're uh, exposed to this and you've learned to do this, it annoys you for the rest of your lives and annoys you every time somebody does this in a paper. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very easy to learn to do this the right way uh, and you don't have to be annoyed by it afterwards. Um, okay, yeah, this one is also one of my favorites. It's definitely one of Claire's favorites. Write justify columns of numbers. Uh, this is a quote from Claire's blog uh, where she insists, uh, she writes this in, in all caps because she really means it. Write justify columns of numbers. Apparently um, you all will uh, or are likely to argue with me and Claire about this because for some reason you really want to left justify or to center columns or, of numbers. It is unclear why you want that, but apparently you want that. Uh, and you should stop wanting that. Um, I, um, I actually got into a fight with the TSE editor about this because they kept trying to center my uh, column of numbers and it's the worst. So by right justifying instead of centering or, or left aligning, um, you ensure, well, and also by ensuring that you have the correct number of digits and, and same number of digits um, for all of your numbers, you are ensuring that somebody quickly scanning a column of numbers can get a very, can get a quick sense of the uh, magnitude of those numbers if they're right justified, okay? because the uh, bigger numbers will take up more width, okay? And you can't do that if they're left justified unless they happen to all be in the same order of magnitude, which you, know, you may or may not be lucky to have that. But just remember to always write justified columns of numbers. Um, this only applies to numbers. The text should always be left justified in your tables. So again, you will probably fight me on this and Claire, presumably, and you will want to center your text in, in columns in tables for uh, unclear reasons. So try to avoid that temptation and left justify them instead. Okay? The only okay. thing is- 
Uh, okay. Uh, so what about those numbers with significant levels? Those stars that if you write justify that the numbers with two stars, the decimal will not align with number with one star or no stars with that. That is only the case if you're using the wrong package in LaTeX to display your tables. If you're using the right package, the right package is called D column, the letter D followed by the word column in one word. If you're using the package D column, that automatically um, formats these things appropriately so that the justification ends before the p-value starts. The alignment ends before the p-value starts begin. So this oh. is a this is not a fundamental flaw of this uh, principle. It is just a flaw of you implementing it. Um, okay, uh, some minutia. So capitalize table, figure, section, when you're referring to them uh, in your main body. Um, refer only to sections and not to subsections, even when you're referencing actual subsections. So it's not subsection 4.1, but it's section 4.1, even if you're referencing a subsection. Um, include a non-breaking space between the words, figure, section, et cetera. Uh, and the actual reference. Similarly, between um, the preceding words and the following citation. Okay, that is so that there um, you you instruct the LaTeX compiler to not break lines in between those things. You do not want a line to accidentally end with the word figure and then the number three to be on the next line after that, okay? You want figure three to always be together on the same line. Same for citations. You don't want lines to start with citations, with references to citations. Um, okay, yeah, be consistent about capitalization and punctuation in your headings. Do not use citations as nouns. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. So never write like uh, in the first example, in 14 blah, blah, describe something. Okay, always, if you're, do, if you're writing like this, always refer to the authors by name. Okay, uh, Hazelwood et al. And then citation number, describe something or something. Okay. Um, right, citations go before punctuation, never after. Um, I, I didn't even consider this until I had a student do this that I had to sort of teach not to do this anymore. Um, but never put citations after punctuation, always before. Um, the same for footnotes, except in reverse. Never put footnote marks before punctuation. Footnote marks always go after punctuation, never before. And there's never space between punctuation and footnote marks. Okay. Um, I am right now on the FSE program committee reviewing, I don't know, a dozen or so research papers, and probably three quarters of them are misusing this footnote um, writing style. So I, I can't believe um, how many times I have to comment on research papers uh, for people to place their footnotes in the right place. Um, okay, so, right. Use commas in the right place. Use Oxford commas always. I will not accept any argument to the contrary. Uh, I, there is no, uh, to me, scenario in which um, Oxford commas make things worse. It seems to me like they're always removing ambiguity rather than adding ambiguity. I, I see no reason not to use them always. So instead of, I love my parents, comma, Lady Gaga and Humpty Dumpty, which implies that your parents are Lady Gaga and Humpty Dumpty, 
the Oxford comma there, um, I love my parents comma, Lady Gaga comma, and Humpty Dumpty removes that confusion because this implies that you love three sets of things or entities or people, including your parents and Lady Gaga and Humpty Dumpty, okay? So always less ambiguous with Oxford commas than without. Um, and I think that's it. The only last thing uh, that I want to mention, this also came up recently. When you're choosing colors for graphs and figures, please ensure that A, your colors are visible when printed in grayscale. A lot of people still print their research papers uh, and often people have a grayscale black and white printers, not color printers. So if you're using um, colors in your figures that happen to print to the same grayscale tone, they'll be indistinguishable when printed in black and white in grayscale. Okay? So be mindful of that. And lastly, um, choose colors that are color uh, that are safe for uh, color blind people. Okay, so red and green are typical examples of a no uh, no no. Right, do not use red and green in the same figure because um, there are many people um, with the specific kind of color blindness that cannot distinguish between red and green. So they'll not be able to distinguish the colors in your figure. Instead, refer to uh, safe color uh, palettes that um, are designed specifically with uh, grayscale printing in mind and color blindness in mind and so on. So that's it. This is a whirlwind of minutia about uh, production. I call this research production. It has to do with writing, presenting, uh, communicating, and so on. Um, we'll skip BibTech. I'll end here.